on the subject of risk. My second startup, my first startup was a clothing company, which I was very familiar with, because I worked for a, a 10 billion pound company before. My second startup was actually an IT company on the same concept of because I came from a retail background. So retail was familiar to me. And the opportunity to operate a, an ice cream with a totally different perspective became attractive to me. So I jumped into it and I started. I'm not going to go into too much detail. We don't have time for that. But they brought in the q and If you want to learn more about my ice cream business, which is still running today, uh, uh, I, uh, we can talk a bit more. But here, to give you a, an impression of how a mixed bag of experience I have, that when I jumped into ventures, I don't really look at the trade. I look at the opportunities in that market, the weaknesses of the competition. So here I am, five months ago. I started a, a so-called handyman business. This is the, the competitors of my builder, Chapter Train, and uh, uh, Task Rabbit, people like that, with a Romanian partner of all, 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 all and, and uh, someone who actually came and did my home and did a really good job, and I was very independent. And I told them, at what time do you want to actually put down your toolbox? I said, oh, that's an interesting question. Let's have a chat about it. And there you go. So that's me. And uh, so my current job, the company is called Handy.com, called UK. Uh, 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 don't ask me where we came up with the name of my, my first business was Chicky Duck and then my partner said, hey, why don't we, since you're the founder of the business, why don't we just do something with the duck? Okay. So, so I just went with it and I loved the logo. So we're basically <coughs> at a platform like a Uber of tradesmen. And that's nothing new because as I said earlier, there's my builder, check the trade, trust the trader. Many companies like that in the UK doing the same thing. But why do we think that we could do it um, uh, better because I have had nine months of experience having arrived here and trying to do something with my home. And I and I have studied to the finest detail what is the problem with the train. I have been screwed up several times. I have fed up with the four hour waiting windows at home. And I see what I see is opportunities. And I decided that, that is the thing I actually want to do because coming from, you can say, a user or uh, uh, a meaner description that uh, you can call me a victim. Okay. So basically, whenever I start with a business, I think my grid is along these lines. <coughs> the, the brain has to uh, be uh, functioning in a way where we, we brainstorm to the finest detail how we can improve the consumer experience. And that is through studying what is the problem with the trade. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, so, and then we have to recognize on the supply side, who are the people who are going to help us succeed? And then on the demand side, who are we selling to? <coughs> this may look like a very simple uh, grid, but if you adapt an example of the same business, but putting different priorities on the grid, I'll give you a classic example. Of Facebook, you probably know them, and you know, probably heard of the breakup between Eduardo Severin and Mark Zuckerberg. The main difference, as I've studied their cases, is that Mark Zuckerberg thinks they have the same concept on the brain, but Mark thinks that the supply is actually from the social networking, creating these users, and the demand will eventually be the advertisers. But Eduardo Severin thinks differently. He thinks that, okay, we agree on the brain, but he thinks the supply is the advertisers, and that the, the demand would be the people who eventually want to use social networks. So that's where they have the disagreement. Because to Mark Zuckerberg, he says, unless I have 100 million subscribers to Facebook, I'm not going to start the business. So Eduardo Severin thinks that he actually reversed the left and the right. And he thinks that Eduardo got it wrong. All right? So that would be an, an example of how I also use, look at uh, these issues. These three components are very important to me. I mean, the supply and the demand has to be identified precisely. And so that you actually have a consensus on, at least during the trial period, moving in the right direction. I'm done, okay. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so, so then, uh, I hope I was able to drive the point across. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a fixed grid on every single concept. As you, 
on the Facebook example, two partners could actually come into a fight because they don't agree on where the who is the supply and who is the demand, okay? Here's my business. It's the supply that we look at is when the tradesman sees us versus trust the trader, my builder, blah, 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 trust rabbit. We want to have a solution answer to them is why they should provide their services to us and not to these other companies which they have to sign up for. And that's a, the, the, uh, there's a very long list of reasons which I'm not going to go into. You can feel free to uh, ask me in the Q&A. But, but in short, we want to give them a better experience. And we have identified what, it, what is the definition of a better experience for the handyman trade, for the plumber trade, for the electrician trade. And then, then on the demand clearly are the people who need work done like me before. Uh, they want to have their homes improved. And then we always have to look at uh, the other beneficiaries that, because they are potentially the sources of, of income for us too once the platform is successful. But at, at the same time, at, in the meantime, I would say, I have the same uh, stubbornness like what, uh, what Zuckerberg was uh, uh, back in the early days of Facebook. I do not allow my partners to go start talking to Screwfix or, or B&Q or, or DFS and see what we can do for them because <coughs> we need to build a customer database initially of 10,000 homes before I would allow advertising revenue to even uh, surface. But if we are able to achieve that, I'm sure the platform will be attractive enough. So when we go and talk to these people and we tell them that we have a 10,000 customer base and we have 3,000 tradesmen working for us, it's a lot easier to go to these people. You want to put your name screw fix on our platform and we'll charge you 100 pounds every week, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. That will come naturally. It's definitely not a priority. So you call this a money burning stage. I'm burning money because I'm hiring people, I'm getting jobs, and I may not get, okay, all right, that, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, all right, all right. All right, so in the businesses I do, I emphasize very heavily because I'm not a tacky guy, I'm not inventing a new product, I'm not inventing anything new, so what I love doing as an entrepreneur myself, as a serial entrepreneur myself, is I love doing, doing it better than, than the guy next door. This is always my motto. So I look at this business model, and then I decide to go into it, and I look at how can I do it better than the guy next door. So better than my uh, competition is what I mean. So here are our, our four main KPIs that I've said. We have to guarantee job completion. It may sound a little bit funny to some of you, especially if you, are, if you haven't actually spent any money on home improvement. Like, how does guarantee job completion become a key performance uh, indicator? You're supposed to guarantee completion, but trust me, I've had a lot of experience in it that they don't complete. Uh, 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 but I won't go into it. And then, as a result, then we, can, we will be able to ask, uh, to promise the customer that they only pay once because there are several occasions, obviously, when the job is not completed. Platforms will tell them, the Ubers of our trade will tell them, I'm very sorry, I'm gonna blacklist this tradesman, and can I find you someone else to do it? And that is not us. What we will say is that, I'm sorry that we didn't finish it, we'll send someone else to come and finish it. And the customer asks us, so do we, do we have to pay for the next time? No, we guarantee completion. And this is a lot harder than said because when we try to work with tradesmen and we tell them one of our key performance indicators guarantee completion, some of them think that we're a scam. There's no way, this is not the industry. We don't guarantee completion. We do as much as we can in the day and we can't finish, we go. And then we're booked tomorrow, so we can't come back. Believe me, this is happening in the UK. And so it's, this is my biggest challenge. The guarantee completion is my biggest challenge in hiring people the, and in promising the demand side, right? And so that, Supporting the trades is, is a later issue. My purpose today is, I think, is enough said about my business. I'm not here to advertise uh, uh, my business, but uh, feel free to go online and, and, and call us up if you have any issues with your home. We'll be very happy to offer the service, but that's enough. But basically, I, I hope uh, today I'll be able to share with you um, to, br to light up the fire, fire in you so you want to be your own boss. Right? I, I said earlier, uh, part of the reason why I became my own boss. But I genuinely believe that I have reached a stage after 30-something years of becoming my own boss that I'm no longer competent in working for people. 
I don't have the patience for it. And I think the triggering point on, the, on, on, on my final note of I got to change is that after I worked for this big garment company, there was an opportunity for me to work for a smaller cosmetic company which offered me shares to become a shareholder because I wanted to be my own boss. I went to the interview and I have come to learn about myself that I'm terrible in, in interviews. The more senior I become in my position when I reach the stage of CEO, I'm terrible with meeting people who try to judge me as to whether I'm right for the job. The thing that triggered me into finally saying that enough, I'm not working with people anymore, was that the guy, he wants to talk to me about how I can manage the company. He wants to know the operational side of things. I gave him a lot of critics about his product, his craft. He was almost like not interested in listening to why I want to criticize his product. If you're going to work for us, just tell us how many people you have managed before, like what are the operation experience you have. I have no interest in talking to him about that. I wanted to talk to him about what's wrong with your product. And then he, he, he reached his final stage and, and said to me, hold on, hold on, hold on. So what is the difference between me hiring you and someone who is an experienced manager at Nike? And that was the point that I said, all right, if you have to ask, goodbye. And that was really the, my end game as to why I have since then not worked for anybody. Right? So I want to talk about, as we always read, work-life balance. And I promise you, there is no such a thing. And the irony of it is that you hear a lot about when you're passionate about your work, you, you never have to work a day in your life. So if you believe that that is not a lie, then why do you even have to read about work-life balance? There's some books that talks about work-life balance. And to me, as an entrepreneur myself, save that money and buy a comic book, right? Because you're not gonna learn anything from it. There is no, if you wanna be your own boss, there is no work-life balance. Your work is your life and your life is your work. It's a matter of how you tone it down and the, and the moment when your company gets on track that you create some freedom, such as in today's technology, working from home, all the goodies are now available to compare when I started out 30 years ago. So you guys are very lucky, right? So you really can ignore work-life balance because it will come naturally when you're your own boss, right? When you hire more people, then you have your work-life balance. You, you tell them to do the stuff, right? And so you can go home and play with the kids. And don't even believe that this, when you're passionate about your work, you never have to work. That you have, as the boss, as the owner of a company, you work every day. You work Sundays. At least that's my experience. It's a matter of how you structure your work. And if you're not up for it, go work for someone else. Go be an employee first. And I actually recommend it because look at my background. I worked for someone for 13 years and I had a burnout job. In my 13 years, the final four or five years as the CEO of that company, I travel 250 days a year. I wake up in the middle of the night. I don't know whether I'm in Korea or Japan. I have to have, look, look at my diary, you know. I had that kind of a wild life. And it's a good experience. My son today, who works for Apple, has a 200-day travel job as well. He wakes up, he doesn't know which city in China he's in as well. That's a good experience too. Especially if you are not yet convinced, and if you are dreaming of coming up with a business so that you find your work-life balance and that you love your job so much that you never have to work a day, Mark my words again, you have to work every day because it's your own bloody money. And so I get asked questions a lot. I call them the entrepreneurs, the FAQ. How do you feel about unions? At the point when I had my children wear business, I had 25 stores in Hong Kong and 40 stores in China. How do you feel about unions? Uh, I love the answer he gives. He always tells people, I hate unions. But he doesn't, the way I read Elon Musk, he is a master of balancing that. I don't think he meant he hate unions. I think because he is so influential in the world of business, in, with his electric cars and his rockets and his all other uh, business ventures in the boring company, he understands that he, his, his opinion matters. And in saying so, he makes employers pay more attention to how to work with unions and he makes the unions pay more attention to how to work with the employers. I like, and I love it that he's candid and he talks about it and he doesn't avoid the subject, right? So, so, so 
the, uh, uh, if you ask me, I, th I think that, especially in my experience in the UK, uh, um, I learned not to call my staff after seven o'clock. I had to learn it. Uh, I wasn't that, I wasn't like that before. I, I was just think that, let's have a WhatsApp group. We always have with the senior managers, WhatsApp group. And then whenever I think of something that I think will be very urgent for tomorrow, I'll just send it off. And then I don't even look at the time. Sometimes it's 11 o'clock in, uh, in the evening. But I think in the UK, I learned a lesson. There's something that, uh, that uh, I'm still learning. Uh, I'm still being yelled at. Like, did you know what time you sent me that message last night? Because I would usually call them in the morning. I say, did you get my message? And my answer is not yes or no, but did you understand? Did you realize how, what time you sent it to me? Oh, okay, apologies. And so people ask how many hours of work we do a day. I answered that already. I, I, I can't even answer you. Sometimes two, sometimes 12. Uh, I sleep an average of four to five hours. That's a habit that I've developed since I've become my own boss. So I don't have an answer for that. And, then, and, the, and the point about risk taking, risk adverse, as I said earlier, if you're still on this subject, then try and find an answer for yourself because I don't have an answer. Everything I do, including, as I said earlier, working for people, I take risks. I take risks to the extent that I go on and do what I believe in doing, I might get fired. I still go with my opinion. Otherwise, the company doesn't need me. All right, so um, in this bullet point, I want to explain a bit about what we have in our stomach as having started a, a few businesses on my own. Uh, my personal experience is a small appetite, uh, and I mean that literally. Uh, uh, act Actually, I'm, 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 I'm inspired in several ways in terms of how people maintain their alertness, how Bruce Lee maintained his, his alertness as a Kung Fu master, how even one book I really love called The Holy War, Inc., uh, written by Peter Bergen, who actually was one of the reporters who interviewed Osama bin Laden. And he asked him, why are you so skinny? How do you survive? And he would tell you that I don't eat a lot. OK, I don't worship him, don't get me wrong. But I think there's a reason why people talk about food, talk about the volume. I am one typical example that I don't enjoy dinners. Don't even try to bring me to a Michelin star restaurant. I can't tell the difference between the food. Any dinner that requires me to sit beyond one and a half hours, I stand up and leave, unless the conversation is really good, not the food. Right? So that's me. Right? I'm not asking you to do it, right? I'm, I'm sharing what I'm made of today. Medium understanding of self-limit. And you'll read a lot in books about when you start a business or you work for people, you have to know your limits, you have to know what you can do and what you cannot do. As a business starter, I would recommend that you have a medium understanding. That's enough. Don't understand too much about, don't have any prerequisites about, no, that's not the industry I can do. That's not something that I like to do. If you found the three, the core, the supply and the demand, and you think there's a market for this business, go into it. Knowing your limits may not be a good thing as an entrepreneur. Right? I would never can tell you that I could do so well with my ice ring business that went public and I sold it at a handsome sum before I leave Hong Kong. I could never tell you when, when you asked me 2007, that, so that's 15 years ago, that how, how did you get into it? I just got into it. I just thought that there's money to be made. And I, and I, and I do not know my self-limits. I didn't think it was important at all. And a big ambition. A big ambition is not taking risks. A big ambition is always, and I, and, and I will define that much more clear in this way, that many people say, I come and start my own business, and then after X, X, X period of time, I attract a venture capital. After X, X, X amount of volume, I go public. I don't ever go down that route. I do believe that if you start a business and you structure it and in terms of compliance and organizational management to a way where it can be sold to a bigger conglomerate, it's a responsibility as a founder of a business. But I never start a business to sell to people. Never ever. I don't think this is a way that will make me work hard enough to actually want to grow this business to where it deserves. So my ambition 
is to have absolute good compliance and absolute admiration from my comp competition and great praises, five-star trust pilot uh, uh, from my customers. You can check out the handy duck. We have quite a few five stars so far, or even having j just been in business for five months. But my ambition does not include, one day I'm gonna sell it to Pinnacle, which is our, one of our competitors and the biggest company that has recently sold its stakes to a large uh, a retail, uh, you know, a real estate company. I never go down there because it will take away my ambition to make this business keep improving. And you have to hate comfort zones. Right? Love race, very cliche thing. You have to hate comfort zones. You have to get, you have to always be uneasy. Why are things so smooth today? You've got to go and find some trouble and make your business better. That, and that's me. And this, I emphasize heavily, you have to live under poverty. Because I ended up with this fashion conglomerate with a decent amount of seed money. But I never, run the business as if I have a few hundred million, I uh, know, uh, 20, 30 million pounds to burn. I don't run the business like that. I run it like I only have a few hundred bucks in my pocket. And uh, I don't go hire a driver. I don't build a flashy office. So I don't mind, maybe simply, simply put, I live a very humble life, even when I am my own boss and have people working for me. Right. And, um, okay, all right. How, how I went about um, uh, uh, starting these businesses that I uh, start, uh, um, I'm obsessed about the, the ever-changing consumer behaviors. And I think, I think I've given you some example in, um, in Handy Duck. I'm observing about the mistakes of the trade as a consumer uh, myself as well. And uh, uh, I, I, I also recommend that you, um, I describe myself as an, intro, as an introvert, even though I'm speaking to you today, but it, it did take a bit of courage. I didn't say yes right away. I mean, I, it's easy on a smaller group, you wanna ask me about my experience, but I'm, I am by default not a showman. As you can see, I, I, I don't uh, put up a very good show. I think there, there, there are lots of guys that can, you know, you know, yeah. But, but um, I can sell a story. At a certain point, I, I'm confident I can sell a story of Handy Duck to any group that, is, that likes the way we run it, that likes the way that we've structured it. I can paint a big picture for them, right? Although, I, 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 I do admit that I, I am not a very good salesman. Uh, I mean, I, I'm an operator myself. And, but because I emphasize, I'm to totally obsessed about craft over wealth. To me, that guaranteed completion is in this handy duck business, the craft. As ridiculous as it sounds, it, gives, it has given me all sorts of trouble in trying to deliver that. And I'm still at it. I'm still committed to it. In my children's wear business, I'll give you an example. Where I hear in the Chinese a heading, I was interviewed in Hong Kong, why I, because Hong Kong was so aggressively attacked by fast fashion in the children's wear, why I still continue to do quality. And I told them that I see my tagman there. I'm a, I'm a 20 million, about 30 million pound business in Hong Kong, making reasonable profit. And they are 300 million, business, making their version of reasonable profit. I'm happy where I am. I'm happy with the craft that I'm doing is what I know best. What the craft that H&M and Sarah and the Prime Mark are doing is not something I understand. And I do not have the ability to make my suppliers to create those kind of products. So I stay where I am. Because in, as an entrepreneur, a business is not about size. A business is about profit. My ice rink is, all, is even smaller in terms of turnover than my children wear business in Hong Kong, but it makes double the profit, right? That's what I emphasize on. The, to be successful in the business is about profitability. It's not about getting big. So I would, I would, I would never be able to understand how these tech giants are able to convince these venture capitals to keep letting them burn 
billions and billions of dollars until they turn profit. Like a classic example would be Uber, right? They're still not making profit, but the company is huge. It is listed, right? It, it has got shares that is worth something, which in normal arithmetic terms is worth nothing. All right, so uh, the other thing I want to share with you is that every now and then I reflect and I and I and I accept where I have been successful and where I completely failed. These are the lists of things that I think I did a pretty good job as CEO for Esprit Asia, this big fashion con uh, conglomerate. I think I did a pretty good business in Hong Kong for my own children wear company. I tried to do a magazine and try to be a media mogul. I absolutely fell flat on my face. And, uh, and my ice ring is quite successful. I sold it and, it and it's still running today. So, and I think we will all understand that um, what failed yesterday may not fail tomorrow, right? And I use this little cliche photo there is that this is, as you know today, seven out of 10 vehicles sold are SUVs. And this is the 1960 Jeep model that they tried to introduce called it the station wagon. At that time, that project completely flunked. And today, 60 years down the line, uh, yeah, 60 years down the line, I mean, SUVs are the best selling vehicles. Oh, and I, and I, um, All right, well, uh, uh, I mentioned briefly about Uber. That is another business model I constantly study, even though they're not making any money. I think that number one, they have solved a problem for many big cities when it's so difficult to hire a taxi. You have to go to the street and wave at one. They totally changed that, and now you can actually go on an app and hire a taxi, and, uh, and, 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 and that's revolutionary to me. But on the other hand, as you've, for those who have used Uber, you understand that they also keep on, keep on falling short in terms of what they deliver. Because Uber's problem now with the business model is that the busier the time is, when the demand is at its highest, this is where you get a negative experience. They up the rates. They don't show up. Uh, they don't have cars nearby. They want you to go to Uber Premium. That as a consumer experience from the demand side is a terrible business model. And I think they're going to overcome it. I think London is going to be the first place that they will overcome this because the city drive limits are so slow at 20, 30 miles an hour. It is, mark my words, this is going to be the first market in the world that will have robocabs. And when they have robocabs, Uber will solve that. But Uber has also brought to humanity a wonderful, wonderful change, which I absolutely adore them for, is that they've made better taxi drivers. I love them for that. Now, I have very few negative experience with Singaporean taxi drivers, London taxi drivers, New York taxi drivers, and all because of Uber. So I encourage all of you to study these different things. They may look very successful on the surface. There are lots of things to learn from them. And so the motto I follow myself is keep changing and uh, never stop correcting yourself. And as I've said earlier, that if you end up working as your initial 13 years like mine in a company that people tell you, oh, no, no, don't take risks. This is too risky. Trust my words. You're probably working, go and work for another company. Because if that company doesn't have appetite to let you try different things, you'll not learn anything from it anyway. Right? So what do I do? What do I want to do next? Lots of things. After handing it up. I want to do something about education. I want to do something. I'm obsessed about bringing the learning of the Chinese language to the UK because we have now 200,000 immigrants from Hong Kong. And these children are going to go into Western education and lose their ability to speak the native language. That's something I absolutely am obsessed about. I, and I might start doing that once I've got Handy Duck up and running. And, uh, and uh, that's one of the ways why I say I want to prepare the next generation for the cruel world. I mean, it's, it is very cruel. But what credential do I have in, in education? None. I have three kids. And I think uh, they are my credentials. Uh, they are all working, suffering, uh, going through hardship, and enjoying their job. They totally understand what I mean by there's no such thing as a work-life balance. How can someone who travels 200 days a year have a work-life balance, right? Stop kidding me. That's my eldest son, who works for Apple, one of the best employees in the world work-life balance my ass. 
And uh, so, so I think I've prepared them. I have a daughter who has, whose dream was to become a filmmaker. She's now working in, in, in Los Angeles. She studied film and she's struggling. She's delivering pizza when she doesn't have projects. She actually loves it. And uh, so that's my credential. I think I, I have uh, been able to be supportive as a father to tell them to go on with their dream and live in poverty. Except if this is what you want to do, hopefully the poverty part is going to be a very short period of time. Well, it was for, for, for me. I went through the time, not very long, but I lived a very, very low budget life for a number of years. And the 20th century business operating models is interesting. It almost is also forever changing every day. I mean, with the work from home to all sorts of technology, Zoom meetings and all that, uh, I'm 60 years old. I've been working for 30 years, 35 as, as my first own boss, working 30 something years myself uh, in retail. And I've just started a business five months ago, right? And I have no office. The Handy Duck does not have a, bad, uh, a, a back office. My Romanian partner keeps saying that maybe we should have an office so we can see each other more, we can brainstorm and say, okay, great, great, great. Okay, let's get to a turnover. I'm not taking a salary either. My pledge to the company is that if we reach one million pounds, we'll have an office. And then they keep saying that because they're all taking a salary. I'm not taking a salary. So they're, okay, Mr. Chow, when are you going to take a salary? I said, I will take a salary from the company when we hit two million pounds. Right? So, and in the meantime, I give them shit. I just tell them that, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? You're the, you're the guys taking a salary. I'm not taking a salary. Right? <laughs> Lovely, right? It's a, it's a strategy. I mean, I'm not Mr. Kind. I mean, I intentionally not take a salary because it allows me to do that. No, I'm, I'm actually not that mean, I'm just joking. Yeah. All right. So in the meantime, I love daydreaming at home. Me and my daughter, the filmmaker, have one commonality, is that we love daydreaming at home. It's, it's just a favorite thing I do. I prefer that over going to the tennis court and play tennis. And, uh, and I, I think all in all, we must remind ourselves that craft is much more important than wealth. If you have the craft, you have the wealth. All right, so, well, um, this is my company before it shut down in Hong Kong. I'm not going to, I promise the school that I won't talk about politics today. As if you re have read about Hong Kong, you know, why I'm, you know why most Hong Kongers are here, because the communist China is taking over Hong Kong. And uh, during uh, the, the democratic uh, movement in Hong Kong, there are companies that uh, supported the movement, there are companies that supported the government. And uh, I happen to be on the right side of history, in my opinion. But then company got shut down. But not an issue. I'm here in the UK and I'm starting again. So these are just some of the ideas that I generate with my staff for the fun of it. It's part of our daydreaming. I'm not gonna go into a barbershop. I'm not gonna go into a headhunter business. But this is stuff we do. We just throw around with the logo and we just keep on coming up with new ideas. And I, 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 I intentionally skip, uh, skip a point in the, in the, in the, in the FAQ and the, and the stomach of entrepreneurs, and that is the keep phone number of your mentor. This guy, this shorter guy on my left-hand side, is my ex-boss from Esprit. He was a very humble man from China who took over the entire company and that went public globally. And I, I still have his phone number. I speak to him every now and then, and we have great conversations. Uh, he is, of course, a hundred times more wealthy than I am, but we keep in touch. And so, uh, questions, please. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll try and break the ice with the first question because I think some of you would probably feel a little maybe don't want to ask questions too personal. I'll break the ice. I always do this. What is my net worth? Some, some people have asked me, all right? My answer is, I don't know. I came to the UK, I bought a $2 million home. But I, I only do that because I already have an established business and substantial saving. If I was a younger entrepreneur like you guys, I'd probably buy a $1 million home and use the other million to start a business. But I bought a $2 million home, I bought two cars with cash, and I have money for my three meals a day, and I can't tell you what my, balance, what my ba uh, bank balance is like. 
I honestly, I'm not trying to play humble. I don't care. I have enough money to live until my last day, I believe. And in the traditional Chinese, there's a saying, and it's even more so important for entrepreneurs, is that when you are gambling, you don't count your money. I'm still in business. I just started a new business. So I'm still gambling. I'm not gonna look at my bank account because I'm burning money, right? All I know is that I have put away enough so I can live on and drive on and push on, all right? So that's the, the answer to my net worth. Yeah, I get that. What do you like to change in your life? If you are born again, what do you like to change in your life? Which is the first one. Oh, it's the first one. Okay. Um, wow. Can you all hear that? Yeah? Okay. Having experienced two years in the UK, if I am born again, I, I would want to be born in the UK. Unions. Yes. Um, well, okay. Well, you, you sound like you might have Googled me before you came here. Well, I actually have very good experience with the union in Germany. When I worked for this company, Esprit Asia, for this man, uh, I was both his CEO for, uh, for Asia and also uh, his, his assistant. I, I, I basically go and take care of a lot of things that he doesn't want to do. Uh, he has a CEO in Europe, and he's global. Right? So I, th I think we did a pretty good job in that department and helped the gentleman wrote a script 